Welcome to Many Talks Podcast, talking all business, entrepreneurship, property development, finance and investment. Brees Many here, your host of Many Talks. I've um, got another fantastic guest with me. We've travelled up to Bristol today. Um, fantastic for, for Rob to give us his time to come on to Many Talks. Um, we're going to be talking about his journey, his entrepreneurship journey from the start really, but we're going to go further back in detail from when he started, when he was little, when he was at school. For you that have listened um, to the podcast before, we've had some fantastic guests, but this guest really excites me. He's got a fantastic business, um, MBE from, from, from the Queen. Um, so he's had some fantastic achievements, which we will talk about throughout this interview. But Rob, thank you for coming on and thanks for your time today. No oh, pleasure to have a chat, Reese. No problem. So what I really want to start about and, and talk to yourself about because I know that you've got a degree in designing. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you was at school, what was the journey like? How, how did you get into that role of designing? Was it something that was brought to you at a young age? Well, I guess growing up, I was, uh, I was a big fan of Lego. Okay. Always building spaceships and space stations. <laughs> uh, and uh, I did have a bit of a creative flair. Um, dyslexic, I actually went through most of my school being un- undiagnosed as dyslexic, so okay. I had to attend special needs classes, yep. uh, uh, which was quite challenging. But um, so I, I moved away from your traditional subjects, although I was reasonably strong in, in maths. Mm. And um, and yeah, just found myself in graphics and art, um, not really knowing much about this kind of product design thing, because back in the 80s product design wasn't that well known yeah. uh, as, a, as an industry mm. um, and uh, I did a work placement when I was 14 at a product design consultancy in Chester I'm from the northwest originally and that really sold me on this idea of uh, creating products for consumers and there's quite a, there was quite an artistic way of um, presenting your concepts um, using markers back in the day before CAD uh, computer engineering yep. um, on the computer and uh, I really love that kind of art form so I sort of developed this skill as being able to create these pretty illustrations of uh, of products and that, that kind of really put me further into trying to learn more about what product design was. And, and what um, age was that that you, you started using that kind of system? 14. 14, okay. So before that when, when you was at school you, you used to obviously play with Lego a lot. a lot of kids play with Lego um, similar to myself but did you find that you was more creative than, than some of your younger friends when you was at you know primary school coming through to secondary school can you remember that well, I wish we were allowed to play Lego <laughs> at school now but um, um, well it was only really in the art classes and the, yeah. the graphics classes that there was a bit more of a, a talent there okay interesting interesting and obviously moving moving through school what, what was your mindset? Because entrepreneurs' mindset, a lot of entrepreneurs are, are very similar in terms of um, they've got that drive, they've got that determination, and, and some of that comes from playing sport or something that they find that they're good at, um, that will to always win. Was, was you similar to that at, at a young age? Ah, let's think back. I, I mean, all my friends played football. I'm not very good at football, but I played, and I was always on the subs bench. So <laughs> there wasn't a huge determination there, other than just to hang out with my pals. Yeah. Uh, I kind of found uh, running was kind of more my thing, kind of doing stuff on your own. Yeah. Um, and that's grown over the years. I now do, uh, and and I'm an, an amateur triathlete. Okay. Um, but uh, where did my drive and determination come, come from? I think kind of growing up with a I've actually got an illness so kind of dealing with that was quite a, a drive for me to, to stay alive and succeed mm. okay and and that was a, a drive from a young age uh, y- yeah more the kind of teenage years I think and, th- and that's what gave you that drive but okay. I had no interest in business didn't study business oh, you uh, did I just wanted oh. to be a product designer uh, my father ran a retail interior design business. He built all the Laura, designed all the Laura Ashley shops um, okay. back in the day. Um, and so you a, had that creative in, in yeah in he, your he, family he had that kind of design element. Um, and uh, he was a workaholic, so I swore to myself I wouldn't <laughs> become a workaholic and I'd enjoy my life. Okay. Um, so I kind of really followed a career in product design. I went to an open day in Northumbria, Newcastle, and had two very different experiences, one in the civil engineering course mm. and one in the product design course. Civil engineering, they politely told me I'll be uh, testing concrete for four years of my life. And, uh, <laughs> Didn't product, sound very interesting. No, product design, they said, oh, look, we send our students to San Francisco, to Hong Kong, to New York, 
all around the world on placements, um, designing all this cool stuff and had these amazing pictures on the wall of what yeah. the students had created. Jonathan Ives of Apple fame studied there a few years ahead of me uh, and it was at the time the best course to go, go to. Quite keen to, to move away from home and just start my life, but I was told I should go and do an art foundation. So I stayed an extra year at home doing an art foundation while all my friends went off to university just to kind of really explore that more creative route. Because I'd studied maths, physics and uh, design at uh, A-level. So just to jump back in there, Rob, from, from what you just said, your father was a workaholic and, and you said that you weren't going to be a workaholic. Um, I- explain that in a little bit more detail because a lot of um, young entrepreneurs, people that listen to this podcast, even myself, um, you know, entrepreneurs do do have to work hard. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only once you become successful, um, you, you can reap the benefits of having a good team around you. And we talk about your team and how you've built it. But from a young age, you, you said to yourself that you didn't really want to be a workaholic. How, how did that affect your journey as, as coming through? And, and obviously, Trunky being such a, a fantastic brand and a well-known brand, it's probably fair to assume that you did have to work and you was a workaholic in your early stages, or was that wrong? Yeah, I, I guess it was more the observation of running a business requires you to spend all your time working. Yeah. And I spent all my time designing, so I yeah. didn't really view that following my passion as, as work. As hard work, okay, but I understand. Yeah, you worked, what you're worked incredibly long hours creating products, designing both at, at university and then at work yeah and that was an interesting mind shift for me when I started the company actually because I've worked in Taiwan New York Australia uh, for London's leading consultancies and then I moved to Bristol yeah Uh, but as a professional product designer you just worked as long as it took to get the job done done. eating pizzas in the office all night but it's interesting that you don't class that as as workaholic because you enjoy it so is that what you're saying to I guess so I'd never really uh, looked at it considered it much more (laughs) than that but um, and jumping in there, just a, an, another question that I think that's fantastic. And for people that are listening, you know, if you and it's something that we we do talk about a lot. If you enjoy what you do, um, it's, it's more of a lifestyle than it is um, a nine to five work work job, um, so to speak. But just just elaborate a little bit for us on when you worked abroad. What was that like? Because. Um, I know that you've worked in in quite a few countries, mm. and that means time away from your family. Um, how was that? When what, what was what's that experience like? I've never experienced that personally, and I know some of our listeners probably haven't, and some of them mm. might be thinking, well, maybe it's something that I want to do. What's that experience like? Is it hard oh, to cope a, with? It was an amazing experience. I, I guess I must have had a bit of a travel bug. I remember when I was <laughs> sixteen, I think we went to Ibiza. And yeah. I just stood on the beach thinking, Jesus, I'm a long way from home. <laughs> uh, had a bit of a wobble, and then yeah. after that, never looked back. So New York, when you're 20, for a summer was just incredible. Yeah. Every, uh, every spare moment spent exploring the city. Um, Taiwan, I just thought that'd be an amazing cultural experience to yeah. go and live just outside Taipei for a year, working as a product design consultant. Uh, but kind of that turned more into a design slave. So I wasn't really, uh, I, I wasn't learning anything in that role. They were yeah. using my skills to design products. Um, so I kind of felt I wanted to learn more about the trade uh, and did a bit of traveling and then came back to the UK and was fortunate enough to land a few jobs in some amazing consultancies in London. Nice. Um, what did you learn on your travels? What was the what was the, the key benefit? What, what did you take away most from working overseas? Well, it's just fascinating the different cultures and experiences um, uh, from food to religion to all, all just different things, different architecture. Yeah. It was just just fascinating experience and journey just to learn about different cultures, really. If there's anyone out there that's, that's sitting on the fence and thinking, should I do it, shouldn't I do it? Have you got any advice from, from being there and done it before? What, what advice could you give them? What's stopping you? <laughs> That's it. I, there, I guess actually, you looked at, yeah? I did interrailing as well when I was, uh, what was it now? I can't, I can't remember, was it 16 or 18? Travel around the whole of Europe on that train ticket pass. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just just really enjoyed traveling. Okay. Um, let, let's get on to the journey of, of the brand. H- how did you come up with the concept? What, what made you come up with Trunky? Well, actually it was a, a university project. So back in 97, second year product design student uh, we were asked to enter a national luggage design competition it was sponsored by a big plastics manufacturer okay. uh, and i went down to the local department store to look for inspiration and it was there looking at the adult luggage section 
Um, everything was black and boring, but at the time, hard molded plastic suitcases were quite fashionable. You yeah. may remember yeah. there was a brand like Carlton back in the day, uh, along with Samsonite. And um, I kind of noted that, but couldn't find any further inspiration and drifted off into the kids' toy section. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I'm a big kid at heart, but I, I remember distinctly standing in front of the ride on tractors, ride on toys reminiscing about my ride on toy back in the day and then suddenly noting that the manufacturing technology used for ride on toys is called rotational molding and it wastes a lot of space you remember ride on toys have enough space once you lift up the seat for an apple or two okay uh, and that's about it and then thought well actually adult luggage uses this injection molding technology to maximize that space why not m marry the two concepts together and make a really functional piece of luggage that's sculpted uh, to be very ergonomic for kids to sit on and fun for them to ride on. And actually the first sketch for a trunky was a woolly mammoth <laughs> with a child sat on it, holding on to the horns. And this was at university? This was at university. So I, I then went on to win the competition in 98 and the judges took me aside and said, you know what, Rob, you've got quite a commercial idea here, you should try and licence it. Uh, and fortunately through one of my work placements uh, at a consultancy in Kingston upon Thames, they had a relationship with Carlton, yeah. so I got a contact with Carlton. Really excited to go and meet Carlton and present how we're going to revolutionise children's travel together. And how did um, that feel getting that meeting? What was? Oh, it was incredibly exciting. Um, was it hard to get that meeting? Was it a lot of um, hard hard to get from, to, to the not right that person? Not that particular one because no. there was a, an introduction. Um, but they very quickly and very politely told me that I had invented a toy and not a piece of luggage and they were okay. in the business of, of luggage. So they were manufacturing in Croydon back then, uh, got a great tour of the factory, but uh, left completely empty handed. So I went back home, pulled out the yellow pages, started look, doing some research on some toy companies, okay. which toy companies that they t told me I'd invented a piece of luggage and kind of no one wanted to take it. How, how did take that the feel? So on. you've got one company telling you that you've created a toy and then you go to another company and they're they're telling you you've created luggage. Did you did you feel that you was at a loose end? Like, well, no, I, I, I really believed in the idea. I didn't have kids at the time. I, I tried the product out at the local primary school with friends and family. Yeah, and kind of knew I was, knew there was something in it. Um, and uh, I just had to keep going and find, find and was this, some way. Of was getting this just it to you at that time? So Trunky was just you. Yeah, always just been me knocking uh, on in doors those early and... days. So then uh, I. Uh, that, that took a couple of years of getting rejected from manufacturers yep. and I had to focus on my final year studies, graduated with first class honours, went off to work in Taiwan, um, didn't really want to approach anyone in Taiwan about the concept, I was a bit nervous. How about, comes? Was there any reason? Well, just about um, that, about whether, the, well really you need a good infrastructure to, to sell the product globally yeah. and um, there were local you didn't Chinese feel like you was ready then? Yeah. So I, I kept always fine-tuning the design. When I was in Australia, at one point, I couldn't find any professional work, so I worked in a call centre, used to sell Chubb security systems door-to-door -door in Sydney. <laughs> uh, but at any spare moment, I was always dawdling and, and trying to fine-tune this design. And actually going up the east coast of Australia in a camper van, as many people do. <laughs> I was running, a, you remember the titanium MacBooks and those first Apple products that were really cool. Um, running virtual PC emulator, running an, an evaluation version of a CAD piece of software. So you could only save it 25 times before you had to reinstall it. Okay. So it was incredibly slow and painful, but I <laughs> self-taught myself computer-aided design and, re, and reproduced my concept in CAD so that it could be... Um, much easier to then license it to a, a company uh, and then in 2003 I came back to the UK actually the end of 2002 and um, how come did you come back just finished traveling and well I can't we, we were killing, to build the we were brand no no we, we were killing time doing all this traveling everyone we met were bumming around they didn't know what they wanted to do with their lives yeah and me and my partner at the time knew exactly what we wanted to do I wanted to be a product designer she wanted to work in sustainable development and we we're just like why are we wasting time here? Let's just head back. It's been great for 10 months, but yeah. let's just head back and progress with our careers. So um, so we did that. And uh, uh, I went to a, a London toy fair at the beginning of 2003 with my presentation boards, very nervously looking around the show. Didn't want to show it to two bigger <laughs> yeah. companies, trying to find middle-sized companies. So and the reason that you didn't want to, sorry to jump in, but the reason that you didn't want to show it to, to bigger companies is because you, you didn't have um, a pattern on it at, at that time? Is it because somebody could just copy it? I was, I was nervous about it being copied. Yeah. Um, uh, but you can't pattern the concept of a ride-on suitcase. Yeah, okay. We've patented the catches, which are very cleverly engineered. Um, 
uh, but you can't pattern a, an overall concept. But that was your biggest concern when you were at yeah. this toy? I had, I had registered the design back yeah. then, um, so I had some IP. Um, and then I found a, a medium-sized toy company I approached. They, they turned out to be a startup of toy execs, and it was the first time I presented the, the design to a company, and they were bowled over and bit my arm off, and we very quickly signed a global licensing deal. Okay, and then so from, from then on, Sorry to jump in here, it was, it was, it was in your flow there, it was a good story. You was at the, the toy um, exhibition and that's when you found these people that wanted to team up with yourself? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I also, at that sort of time, had approached the Prince's Trust for some support due to my illness. I've got cystic fibrosis okay. and qualified for some of their, um, their enterprise programme funding, yeah. which is hugely valuable to bounce ideas off someone in business. Mm. Um, and they very kindly gave me a... Four thousand pound loan and a five hundred pound grant, okay. and I spent the entire four thousand pound loan on lawyer fees, <laughs> built, drawing up this global licensing yeah. deal, um, and was looking forward to sipping cocktails on the beach when I'm reti- retiring early. I then got a phone call that brought me to Bristol. A, a really good friend of mine from university days was working for a, a design consultancy here, and they were after a freelancer. So I hopped on the train, came over, and that job then turned permanent. And I still wanted to progress my career, so I carried on working uh, as a design consultant. Some of my biggest customers were the, the likes of Unilever, working for okay. some of the big FMCG brands they've got, so Dove, Domestos, Purse, or Rexona, and working for brand managers to innovate in their product category, so I okay. really started learning a lot more about the power of brand. But I got bis- a bit disillusioned with that because I was having to create um, contraptions to put more bleach down the toilet, and electronic deodorant cans required six AAA batteries, and it was all kind of like more stuff for people that they didn't really need and i really strongly believe that good design should be used for improving people's lives okay. not just creating junk that people can just spend more money on and yeah. ends up in landfill so i was getting a bit disillusioned with my, my job and over that three-year period the royalty checks hadn't been flooding in uh, they it all started off very excitingly they secured uh, uh, their fir- first customers in the middle east okay. in saudi arabia uh, and a brand called fula which is the equivalent of barbie over there Bobby, due to cultural differences, doesn't go down too well in the <laughs> Middle East, and they created their own concept. So they 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 took Trunky and called it the, the Fula Trunky Travel Case. They did TV ads that aired in Saudi, uh, which was very exciting. So basically, uh, you just give it to this company and let this company run yeah, with it while you on a global licensing okay. deal. Uh, and thought, what? Well, yeah, how could they fail? So yeah. fast forward three years, they still only had this one customer in Saudi Arabia. They hadn't sold it in the US, in the UK, Europe. Okay. Uh, and their, their challenge had been they were a toy company selling it in the ride-on-toy section as a cheap ride-on-toy when there were much cheaper ride-on-toys toys. using that other m- manufacturing yeah, technique. Makes sense, yeah. Which is why, uh, why all ride-on-toys were made using that technology. So they, they kind of missed the point of it being a lifestyle brand that should be aimed at mum or families and, and enabling them to travel. It was just a cheap ride on toy. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So, um, so I, I distinctly remember in October 2005, they phoned me up saying they're going into voluntary liquidation and they can represent the brand anymore. It took me all of a couple of se- seconds to think, well, I quite fancy having a go at this myself. Yeah. I think it just needs a strong brand to, behind it and reposition the product. And uh, I'll see what happens. Yeah. So uh, I bought the uh, trademark Trunky off the administrator for two hundred pounds, and um, the, my previous employer were very kind to let me work part time okay. and work out because there was a factory in China that could make it for X price. So I had to find some logistics, warehousing, had to figure out my route to market. Started knocking on doors. Guess what the retailers said. <laughs> Go and talk to the luggage buyer. I'm a toy buyer. Go and talk to the clothing buyer. I'm a luggage buyer. Go and talk to the nursery buyer. Yeah. I'm not interested. So no, none of the big high street chains would touch the product because it was too new. Yeah. Um, so so I a just lot started, of knockbacks in the early stages. A lot of knockbacks, lot, lots of knockbacks, but I was just determined to get... As a product designer, initially, you just want to get your product on the shelf. Yeah. You don't care about how much money you're going to make. You just want it out You just so want people, people see to it. see it and buy it and use it. That's yeah. all you're motivated by. Um, so that's that was my first goal really to just get it on on shelf. But back in two thousand and six, you could custom program websites, and mm. a good friend I met in Australia was a programmer, so he built a custom website for me to uh, launch the product off. And uh, on the fifth of May two thousand and six, uh, the first container of Tones and Trixies, the pink and blue trunkies, arrived in Avonmouth docks, and that's now hailed as Trunkie's birthday. 
<laughs> and how did you? Um, I, I know that you went to get funding from Dragons Den, which we we move on to. But to get that first container over, was that? Did you fund that a hundred percent, or did you have to find a way to fund that and get people in to help you? Yeah, no, I funded do... I funded that myself. I okay. took out a ten thousand pound personal loan, and uh, my grand gave us a bit of money. So you was confident, folks, you, you was throwing everything at it to make it work. Yeah, but my business acumen back then was, if it takes me a year to sell that container, at least I'll make my money back. Yeah. Not really thinking too much about once you sell out or come close you to selling, you have to buy more <laughs> and the whole cash flow drain on, on yeah. reordering. Um, so yeah, just took a leap of faith really. And um, How did that feel when that first container turned up? Oh, it was really, really exciting. Um, but then it was slightly overshadowed by a, a quality issue. <laughs> so we got the local paper the Bristol Evening Post yeah. down we got this great photo of me down there with a three year old and the trunk is just arriving yeah. uh, and the first got sent out to consumers who bought it online a couple of local independent retailers around in the Bristol area but then I started getting a few irate phone calls from customers saying my child will sit on a trunk and the catches pop open and um, one of the, the there's quite a few elements to the story but yeah. essentially the, the factory that I placed the PO with went bust so I had to find a new factory in China to manufacture Trunky. Missed my Easter launch window of 2006 and found a factory. We rushed through production. Everything's made in mould, so you can't really get it wrong. It's injection in plastic. Yep. But the metal clasp that we used to use to hold the case shut, they had measured the dimension slightly wrong. So on 10% of the product, when you push down on the top of the Trunky, the catches would ping open. Ah. Oh. Uh, so, so not great for when not, the kids not were great, sitting on it. Not great. So I very quickly got that that um, fixed, FedExed over a load of catches, and then hand fixed every single one in the, the warehouse and sent out spares to consumers. Yeah. But actually, my first learning about the power of customer service was was back then because 2006 customer service was not something people would invest in. Mm. And when I was dealing with an irate customer, I kind of try, defaulted back to my natural state of trying to use a bit of humour to win them yep. over and said, oh, it sounds like your trunky must have caught the sneezes on the high seas. <laughs> Fear not, I'll come back to you with a solution. And actually was able to persuade people that I can mail out spare catches with a run your own trunky ER yep. uh, so I could help sheet them. so they could change them themselves rather than having to take these very bulky products back, fix them and send them back out. So that, that was a good learning point about the power of customer service and that's always been with us ever since. Yeah. So that, that first container had to get uh, fixed, so that, that tainted that uh, slightly. And then two weeks later, I was on Dragon's Den filming season three. Yeah, which, which I wanted to talk about. How, obviously, um, that's, that's got a lot of viewings because obviously how successful the brand's been and you've been since um, then, then you not getting any investment on there. What, what was that like? Because obviously, you've done all the hard work, you, you're still... You're still going through the infant stages. You've got your, your stuff come over, your first um, lot of trunk is in that you've sold. There were some teething problems, as you said, which you think that you've rectified, yeah. you've mailed out to people. So I suppose putting myself in your situation, you're going into the Dragon's Den thinking, well, I've, o I've overcome most of my problems, you're thinking at that time. Yeah. Um, this is a no-brainer. I'm selling, stuff's going well. I've got my first container. Um, I'm not asking for, I value the business at what I value it mm. at. I, I'm not asking for too much. Um, did you go in there expecting to get investment? Yeah, I was fully confident. Yeah. My target was Richard I Farley because yeah. I did my research and he had two toddlers at the time. And um, I was asking for £100,000 for 10% of my business. Yes. So I valued it a million, but I had a trademark, I had a fully engineered product, I had some IP around the product. Yeah. Um, and it had something that I could start selling. Um, straight away so I thought that was a fair bet a fair pitch and I had some independent advice too yeah um, so I went, so on, gone in there went on the den what could possibly go wrong <laughs> what happened well I towed Richard Farley around the studio uh, he was a fully grown man although um, maybe not the tallest in yeah. the, around but uh, so the toe strap was strong enough to pull him around the studio uh, but it ended up at Theo Petita's feast and now kind of semi-famous TV Theo did a bit of a strength test on the, the strap and the strap popped off. It didn't break, it just popped, popped off. off. Um, and that, that, the dragons all just jumped on that. Up until that point, up to the cameras. was it going well in the, it was going in really your well. head you thought, yeah. I've, I've nailed this? Yeah, absolutely. The pitch went almost perfectly. I mean, it couldn't be really faulted from yeah. my point. Um, so they're really engaged, really interested. And as soon as that, that hook popped off, it all went badly downhill. 
And how did that feel? Because I mean, sitting there in, was it, it was five dragons at that time. Yeah. Sitting there, um, one stage thinking, you know what, and, and this is something for our listeners, and this is if, you, if you're inspiring to be an entrepreneur, um, this is the life of an entrepreneur, how things change and you have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. You're standing there thinking, I've just pulled grown man round on this. Um, I've got some engagement. Everything's going well. In a split second, yeah. it gets turned upside down on its head. So it's a bit bizarre. Theo got quite angry. Um, and he said, um, you, you shouldn't come on here with problems, I think. And I said, yeah, but problems that can be fixed. Yeah. And it was like, he just didn't get that that was such an easy fix. Yeah. To make that in a stronger plastic would take two seconds and then get them shipped over. It was a non-issue, really. Um, but he made it a big issue. He made it a very big issue. And Peter Jones said, um, you think you have something, I tell you you don't. In 30 days, I could do a better job than that. And it's like, well, I'm a pretty well-trained product designer. I think yeah. you know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you haven't got a clue. Um, and then I tried to big up the brand. I've got a brand, and they just didn't get it at all. They said, look, we've got Donkey taking the piss a bit. Um, yeah. Duncan Ballantyne. <laughs> okay. and, and yeah, I just, cut, I, I just stood back and thought, why should I fight for this? What value can you really bring to the table if you're just, you just don't see the value in the product and the brand? Yeah. Because so it was going well. I mean, it was, going really was well. pretty interesting. And then uh, Richard was still really interested, but uh, seeing all four go out, he thought he had a, a strong negotiating point of view and was after 50% of the company. I probably would have gone to 20, but 50 was a complete, ne- complete Too no much. Go. Yeah. And, and you walked out of there feeling disheartened? Would that be the right word? I walked out of there wishing I'd invented a time machine and not a <laughs> suitcase. Yeah, I can imagine. So, um, how does it feel now? Because I, I know when we was talking before the podcast, you know, you've been to some award ceremonies and you, you've even, I think you've done another um, program under the Dragons and talking about how successful it's been since not having the investment. Mm. What's it like seeing them Dragons now? Have, have they said that they wish that they invested or that they made a mistake? I know, I know that they can't invest in everything they see and it's a personal opinion, but it must feel good for you when you um, you see them or you're at an award ceremony and well, they've the, been as successful as you have. The media are quite keen to point out um, <laughs> the ones that got away. Um, yeah. So we still get tabloid coverage every new season about the ones that got away. Um, uh, I think Duncan admitted on national TV at Celebrity I Want to Be a Millionaire that I might have been one that got away. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lifestyle program on Peter Jones and his daughter Talia mentioned on that that she told Daddy straight away he made a mistake and he should have <laughs> invested. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're very aware of our success and you can't not see trunkies in airports these days, not no. just in the UK, but all around the world. Uh, we sold over 4 million units now. Um, it's fantastic in, in close to 13 years so uh, they're they're aware of the success but I don't need to gloat no of course um, it, it hasn't all been plain sailing as we said we spoke about some um, with the funding with, with Dragons Den and then as you said the success of selling the amount that you've sold the media that you're getting um, but one thing as, as we were talking again off air but I, I really want to own in on is has it cost you a lot um, of time and money with people trying to copy the brand and bring in um, like, like trunkies out? Because you, you see a lot of copycats out there. Is that frustrating more than anything? Or is it time consuming to deal with getting them off the market? How do you deal with that? I think one thing um, you're never told, all you aspire to be is a successful entrepreneur or get a product to market. Yeah. But as soon as you become successful, not when you first launch, but as soon as you've yeah. proven a track record, then you get copied. Uh, everyone and wants everyone to be gets you. copied uh, <laughs> who are successful. So um, I, I was very keen to stay on top of that. So yeah. we've got our IP, mainly around a registered design for the Trunky, and we vigorously defend that. Um, so back in the day, it used to be going to trade shows in the Far East and policing, finding any copies, getting them taken down. Now that's all moved online. Alibaba, Tmall, Taobao, all those kind of Chinese websites, but yeah. not just Chinese, marketplace websites, yeah. so Allegro in Poland. That's an all, now all outsourced to an online brand protection company that basically do all the whack-a-mole for us. So, so they something for pops you. up, they whack it, it gets taken down, but then they'll, that personal company will then try and relist it and then they whack it down until they're blacklisted. And then, uh, So we've probably had 50 plus copies over the years. Um, has it any has, of them affected has, has you? Has anyone seen one in the high street? <laughs> has it affected your business, copycats out there? 
I'm sure it's eroded some sales opportunity, but um, there was a very big high profile case where we saw a UK company making a, a ride on suitcase who normally supplied just the bargain basement stores. Yeah. Um, and they launched this product, they got it into Tesco's, we took them to the high court and we won on our design registration. Yeah. They appealed that decision and they won. Um, it was actually the day after my first child was born, so that was a bit of a downer. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, we took them all. We did a big PR campaign, got Sir Terence Conran, um, Kevin McLeod, and a few other big leading designers behind us and actually managed to get uh, a hearing in the Supreme Court. But sadly, we lost that, uh, which was more of a tragedy to the design community and yeah. what our rights really are than, uh, than a uh, financial issue for us. Um, but the day after that decision was handed down, we were in every single national newspaper with our lifestyle photography with our pictures um so we've got huge press coverage about it and actually entrepreneurial thinking at the time um i wanted to talk to the press about being copied because i was really concerned that consumers would be c confused by this product yeah and it was a really inferior product literally the catches would just come off in your hands they had a huge return issue with tesco's um so i wanted to shout about it and yeah. the press were like wow no one talks about being copied it's like a brand dirty laundry so mm -hmm. throughout that three-year period we we're able to get a huge amount of column inches championing right. design rights talking about being copied and trying to grow people's awareness about the issue and you think you that, that helped and it worked for well we got something out of it yeah from losing yeah of course <laughs> but i mean for for every other brand out there do you think that you've done good do you think that it's helped um, try and stop that happening in, in the future or not really? Is there still a long way to go? With There's still a long way to go. We, we were lobbying government. We had the year of the IP minister. Everything was going well. We were going to get some fundamental changes in design law. Then Brexit happened. <laughs> so yeah. it, we don't even know what our European rights are going to be no, in IP until Brexit. So it's all off the table at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's, um, what's your forward projection? What, what are you looking to do? In the future with Trunky, what's what's next for you? Obviously, you've been very successful. Um, you're a designer. Have you got other stuff in the pipeline that you're working on? Yeah, well, we're, we're a brand now, so we're um, we don't just make the ride on suitcase. We've no. got car seats that double as backpacks, swim bags that are waterproof that look like fish, called paddle packs, headrests that support children's chins when they're sleeping in the car. So we've built up a whole portfolio right. of travel products. We can't yeah. say we're pioneering children's travel. It's a retail category that didn't exist before. Yep. You've got a lot of your baby brands that do car seats and strollers, um, but then as soon as they get to 12 months, that, that there isn't really any product innovation yep. for toddlers. So we've really focused in on this category of toddler travel uh, and are building out a portfolio of brightly coloured, fun products that enable kids not just to get out on holiday and families to give families confidence to survive and uh, those those stresses and traumas of travelling on holiday, but now it's about getting out every day as well. So we, yeah. we want to create products that give mums confidence to get their kids out and about exploring Fantastic. the world. Well, congratulations on what you've done. Um, just before we follow up, see you. You got an MBE. What what was that like? What how, how did that feel? Getting that call to say that you know that was happening. Uh, it was quite surreal because I got <laughs> contacted by the government or somebody now like yeah. the government when I was on holiday in Cuba. Okay. Uh, and this was what 10 years ago and you couldn't really find any wi-fi in cuba at the time <laughs> it was my first proper holiday after setting the business up after five years yeah. i'd taken so i was a bit worried about why the government were trying to contact me <laughs> so a cu couple of days later i found somewhere to get some wi-fi yeah. and, and had a very st strange call with someone because uh, they couldn't actually tell me exactly what it was about oh. um, and eventually discovered i'd been put forward for an mba and would i be interested in accepting it so, yeah, yeah, silly so question. I certainly bought a, a fairly large cigar to celebrate that one. Going to visit the Queen at Windsor Castle was an amazing family day out. Can I was imagine. thinking there must be a, a little photo, photo opportunity here. So I yeah. thought, let's dress one of the trunkies up as a corgi and maybe we'll get to meet the Queen's dog walker or some corgis. Yeah, okay. I felt a bit cheeky taking it up when I shook the Queen's hand, so I didn't do that. But, uh, <laughs> fortunately enough, later on that day, we were w walking around the grounds of Windsor Castle, bumped into the Queen's dog water, walker and got some fantastic pictures of the Corgi Trunky meeting the Queen's Queen. Oh, unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable, fantastic. What's one of your most proudest and successful parts of, of your journey so far? Your greatest achievement, I could say. I think um, outside of the brand's achievement, yeah. um, one of the things that I'm really proud of, of 
doing was bringing manufacture back to the UK. Okay. So in 2012, we reshored production back to the to Plymouth, and um, uh, that wasn't so straightforward. By the end of the year, that factory had gone into administration, uh, but we decided to buy it out as a pre-pack, uh, saving 44 jobs. We've now grown that factory to 55 people, okay. bolted on our logistics. So we're not only manufacturing trunkies for the whole of Europe, but they move five meters next door to our warehouse, and then they're delivered to mum in France, Germany, Spain, Italy, UK. Um, so you're in charge of everything. everything so we're, in the UK. we have huge control over our supply chain. Yeah, we've massively reduced our carbon footprint, and uh, we're able to be incredibly dynamic with market needs. We, we've launched Made for Me, which is a bespoking platform. So okay. parents and kids can design their own trunky in a billion different color combinations, which gives the a place to the, the creativity and the freedom that children can have to, to create their own products and that gets and is delivered. that online they can do that on the that's online on the website and gets delivered within five to seven working and days and if they wanted to do that what's the website for them to do that on trunky.co.uk just trunky.co.uk and you can design your so just going back to um, Plymouth why, why Plymouth well it's just where their factory happened to be okay um, we did a national tender for, for the project and um, we're surprised to see that um the, the the landed cost price of bringing it in from China was about the same as X Factory from the UK, so that was a real big light bulb moment that it made financial sense to yeah. make in the UK. Um, but then the added value of um, having that dynamic supply chain, being able to manufacture on demand, having the the ability to be more creative with our product, and a lot of the guys in the factory are all from the automotive industry, so we like to say trunkies roll off the production line and come <laughs> to the same standards yeah. as. Honda and Toyota. Fantastic. Um, ju- just a question that you probably get hell of a lot. How how does um, the ride-on suitcase is, is it? Can it still go in the on the plane with you? So it's designed. Obviously, as a, there's a big luggage. Is, there's yeah. been a big clamp down on on air on on airplanes now that you can't take hold-on bags on as much. Yeah. Has that affected you or? No, it hasn't. Hasn't affected us. I mean, it, it is designed as a. A piece of hand luggage it's yep. not recommended to be checked in they still get beaten up by those big yeah. samsonites uh but but you'd you 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 would lose the whole versatility of the product if you have to check it in at the gate yeah because you won't be able to use it throughout the whole airport experience um but we always say it's best to check with your airlines because they are always changing their hand luggage dimensions yeah but, always um but there are very few airport staff who would uh, turn to you take away. it off the kid yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and cause an absolute meltdown in that yeah. queue. So, uh, should it be a centimetre too big? So, Rob, let, let's talk about. Obviously, we, we've spoken a lot about the past. Let, let's talk about the present. What obviously we spoke about it goes. You've got other projects out there. How, how are they going? How, how's the market taken to them? Right now, we're finding the UK is a bit of a challenge. But sixty-two percent of our sales are export. We're now a global brand. Okay. Um, Europe's a key focus for us. Our biggest market outside the UK is Germany now. That's going phenomenally well. France too. Uh, China's quite a good market for us as well. And, and we've got our eyes on the US and evolving that business. So I, I think we have the brand in, in over 100 countries and we're actively trading in about 40 using a network of distributors, but really trying to harness the power of e-commerce now and digital marketing. So there's a lot of it done online now, a lot of business. I think a lot of consumers, certainly in the UK, buy their product online, whether yeah. that's from our brand store, trunky.co.uk, or Amazon, or Halfords, or Boots, or yeah, yeah. Argos, or John Lewis. Um, but I think that the UK has gone through quite a transitionary period with the high street and its relationship with e-commerce, and Europe's going to be following that. So we're taking that learning from the UK and applying that model to Europe so that when the change, when that change sort of hands over, um, that we're positioned in pole position to maximise the opportunity. And, and what's it like um, having a global brand? Because obviously it's, it's hard enough to concentrate um, for, for some of us just in the UK. So having your brand ar- around the world, is it having the right team, the right partners overseas for anybody just looking to, to dominate the... What, what what's the key to it? What's the answer to the success in taking a brand to a, a different country that you don't really know too much yeah. about? Well, d- d- successful business is always going to be about people, whether you're yeah. a product or service. So it's all about Correct. people. So it's getting the right people on board in our team here, um, and finding the right partners to help us grow internationally. Um, so it's all about people. I think it's, it, I get a huge buzz from traveling and visiting these guys or my team do it's all about us experiencing new things 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, having some of my friends who travel sending me pictures of window displays in China yeah. or Beijing or Shanghai with trunkies in the windows, just, just hugely mm -hmm. rewarding. But kind of more so is just reflecting back on uh, the research we do in markets and seeing the customer reviews. I mean, on, on Amazon, we're across Europe, we're in the US, we're in India, Japan. You can read those reviews and we score without a doubt an average of 4.6 4.8 star reviews with the customers in all these different cultures and so trunky seems to have transcended international boundaries yeah and it's a, it's acting as an enabler to get kids out exploring the world so i think we're well on way of fulfilling our mission yeah. um globally which is really really exciting there's still so much more to do yeah um, and what is it when you say there's so much more to do what what are you looking to do what is the more to do well, in the UK, I think we have about 20% penetration of the entire toddler market, okay. um, not just the uh, ABC ones. So coming close to some of those numbers in other markets will just be uh, a seismic change for our business. And how, how do you think that you're going to do that in, in other countries? Have you got a strategy and a plan in place to... Yeah, well, traditionally, we've used distributors, and they're very useful to have their local market knowledge. But as I was saying before, with the, the, the power of digital marketing now, Facebook... Amazon, not to some extent Google, we can really harness these incredibly um, powerful tools that can give you clear ROIs on driving customer awareness and then monitor that through our own channel sales, through yeah. Amazon and through leading other online retailers. So it's really embracing this new technology um, to drive international growth now. So exciting times ahead, you'd say. Yeah, very exciting. Every day is a learning day. <laughs> and and just to go back, um, you, we just spoke about the team. What was it? Is it tough for you to recruit the right people? I mean, for a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people that I've interviewed, getting the right team and the right personnel is always tough. Yeah. Um, how, how did how do you do that? Have you got a strategy that you go through to make sure that they the people that you're interviewing fit in with the team? What what's your process? It's incredibly difficult to find the right people um, and there's no golden <laughs> bullet out there. Uh, but for us, we're looking for the experience and the right uh, skill sets, but equally we're making sure they are going to fit within the team culture here. Culture has been very important since almost day one. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking for like-minded people who can align with our vision, our mission of, of revolutionising children's travel and um, are aligned with our company values too. So really fostering innovation, not just in product, but across the business, yeah. being dynamic, um, being responsible to people and the environment, but also remembering it shouldn't all be serious and we should have some fun have along some the way. Fun as well, yeah. Um, and, and the design of, obviously you're, you're looking to dominate other areas of the world. Do you design product per country? Or like when you're designing stuff now, are you looking where you're looking to get your products out there so you're designing something slightly different? So it's a twofold question, really. That's that's number one. And number two, do you still head up the design? Do you still design everything that, that Trunky Brand lets out? Have you got a group of designers underneath you now? Answering the second question, no, I'm, I'm more of a design dictator. Yeah, than, uh, <laughs> I thought you might than, have. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I really enjoy having the, the experience now of understanding the full supply chain, yeah. how a product needs to sell itself off shelf, how we can replicate that product digitally. Um, so, yeah, I've got a design team who does do the bulk work of the design development, but overseen by by me and my experience and that so. must be tough to work in that design team considering you're know, the you'll, have to, you'll have to ask them but <laughs> we've created the some we've created some fantastic yeah. work. but for, for us it's quite important to um yeah different cultures different markets have different color preferences different style preferences so we we've got what we've called uh, the trunky rainbow so all our wider range and our suitcases are, uh, meet our nine different colors yeah. um so that a yellow uh, seatbelt pad might not sell well here but it might sell really well in Germany okay. uh, for the trunkies we've done a Hello Kitty trunkie which was primarily for expanding our reach in Southeast Asia okay. um, so we, we'll do um, we'll try different things but our, our toddle pack our children's reins an incredibly strong seller here and in China don't sell too well in Northern Europe Europeans aren't too keen on uh, <laughs> their kids. using the the children's reins. So uh, so yeah, different cultures, different preferences. But uh, yeah, and Trunk is still your best seller. Yeah, the suitcase is still the best seller. Sold, yeah. Hotly followed by a car seat called Booster Pack. Okay. Fantastic. Well, look, that, that's it. Is there anything else that you want to? 
talk about as your journey as an entrepreneur? Any other things that you could, any other key points or anything out there for anybody sitting on the fence looking to make a move um, if they're in university or still in school or people that are at a crossroads and don't really know what to do? Um, is there any advice that you could give them? Well, first and foremost, uh, you, you really want to follow your passion. Um, you don't want to follow the money, otherwise you'll end up fairly miserable and un <laughs> unfulfilled. Um, so even if you can buy a new car every year, so what? Yeah, um, yeah follow your passion. Um, and then if you want to start running your own business, you've really got to believe in yourself. You've got to go in with your eyes wide open that it's not going to be easy. Yeah. And you're going to face challenges. And it's your ability to face those challenges head on and get over them that's going to define whether you can be an entrepreneur or not. Yeah. Do you, do you still come up with tough challenges every day now? Well, it's different different sizes daily, but there's yeah. always uh, a big challenge on the horizon, yeah. Well, look, Rob, it's, it's fantastic um, for you to give us your time today. It's been a pleasure having you on Many Talks. There's a lot of um, key benefits there for our listeners. We appreciate your time and thanks for coming on. So for now, what I want to do is thank you for listening. Subscribe, leave a review. Look forward to speaking to you on the next podcast with some exciting guests coming our way.